Thank you so much for listening to Urbanistica podcast. I am Mustafa Sharif, an urban planner, and you're more than welcome to join my big journey of exploring the making of smarter and more livable cities. Please don't forget to follow Urbanistica on the different social media platforms. And also let's connect on LinkedIn. Big thanks to Urbanistica podcast partner, Afri. Afri is an international engineering and design company providing sustainable solutions in the fields of energy, industry, and infrastructure. Are you ready for a new episode? Let's go for it. Hello and welcome to Urbanistica Podcast, Matthias. Thank you. Thank you for having me. How are you? I'm very good. good. Very happy. Happy to be in Stockholm. Nice weather. Yeah. A bit crisp, but I like it. Awesome. So uh, you came by uh, train? Yeah. Yeah. So I had a, had a bit of a train ride in this morning and then I got my way out here to, the, yeah. to your office. Awesome. Happy to have you here. Very interesting story especially for us working with uh, making cities and traffic and all this uh, industry. So take us back in time and tell me about the background of creating Lincoln Co. Well, so Lincoln Co. started from a technology work stream. It started mm-hmm. with a platform for a vehicle. Yeah. But we were very fortunate to get the opportunity to try and do something very different. Mm. So we did not just want to sell vehicles like any other traditional OEM. We got the opportunity together with our owners to try and create something that we called changing mobility forever. Mm. And basically what that meant was we took a brand new approach to what we thought car ownership could look like. Yeah. Mobility in cities mm. and, a, and a sort of community around a brand beyond the physical product. Okay. So basically, I think one of our biggest initial things that we were tracking as a trend was how car ownership was changing. Mm. So there was a clear trend where, let's say, the younger part of the market was moving away from owning a car Mm. to using a car. It's in Sweden, a Swedish market, or where did you see this pattern? Or was it globally? It was a global mega okay. trend, I would say. So, yeah. of course, it's slightly different in in, mm. in the Asian markets, but at least yeah. in the in the Western market, mm. we could see that trend quite across all markets where yeah. we are active today. Do, do we know why? Is it because like the economical situation or like because of sustainability aspect, or not really? I think it's a combination. I think in, in some markets, I think that the, the younger generation of car buyers are locking more and more of their equity into housing. Mm. You see a, a shift yeah. in, in, in how compared to when our parents grew up, maybe, mm. uh, to how it looks today. So it's clearly that ease of access yeah. that, that we provided. And basically what we did was we created a product where you could, as a consumer, step in and out of a car on, mm. a, on a monthly basis. Okay. So no commitment time. Mm. Basically, you pay a monthly fee. Everything is included. Service, insurance everything and we deliver the car at your doorstep that's where we started okay uh, so it has had quite a strong counter positioning to mm. the rest of the car industry yeah very different so so, so i mean our competitors have billions of communi- configurations per model mm. we went with one car mm. two colors and the only option is a tow bar ah. <laughs> and when you then make that available on a monthly basis mm. You have this super strong counter positioning strategy, which had a, a lot of cut through when we came into the market. Yeah. Uh, so it was really fun to try and develop that strategy to just try and be very different. Mm. Slightly, I think, to our owners, maybe a bit like a teenager, <laughs> trying to sort of push the limits of, of, of what's okay. Yeah. Um, but, but it really had a, had a lot of success. So, so that was one of the mega trends. And, and the other trend that we were tracking was how car sharing was developing. Okay. So we said we have this unique opportunity now mm. because we were going to build the software for the car. Yeah. So we thought, what can we do that makes the car special, that makes the car stand out? Mm. Um, so what we did was we, we built in as a in-car app car yeah. sharing. Ah, okay. So, so that means that every vehicle that you see from us on the streets today, mm. we have around 60,000 cars in, in Europe. Wow. All of them are shareable. 
also. Yeah. Yes. So like it's monthly yeah. owned. Yes. At the same time, they you can, can share. It. Yeah. Mm. So let's say that you you you, cu- you become a member of ours. Yeah. Uh, you have a car. You pay a monthly fee. Mm. You can use that opportunity to share that car with also. with others to to lower your monthly. Ah, because rates. you make money, and then the money goes to your uh, monthly. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's quite amazing actually. So last year, uh, our members earned over 850,000 euros just by sharing the cars okay. among themselves. Interesting. Uh, yeah. So like the cars you 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 own them as well like it's yes. you you produce them. Yes. So it's not like uh, a, a normal person can give you their cars and then you put your label and then it's running. It's not like Uber. No, it's not like Uber. So it's so it's a it's a confined ecosystem today at least. Yeah. Of course we we look at our future strategies, but for today we have our car. It's called the Zero One. That's the model name. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a SUV, uh, and and we offer that in our subscription program, but we also offer it on our on our sharing platform. Mm. Um, so so for us, it's it's really a strong combination where we can tie people into a new way of owning the asset. Mm. Of course, we always have a customer who's that's paying for the car. Yeah. So we can scale our car sharing platform faster than the traditional car sharing platforms because someone else is always paying for the car. Mm. Um, and we have grown this into a membership base of close to 200,000 uh, customers across Europe. Wow. Um, and we really see that I think it's around 15% or so of our cars are actively using mm. the car sharing platform. Yeah. So and, and, and these cars are like, um, I don't know what you call it, but more like four people's car or like what kind of how does it look like the car so so the car is a it's an suv it's um, the equivalent within the family would be a volvo xc40 with a long wheelbase okay so it's slightly bigger uh, as so it's a good family car mm. it's a good car for young people and and of course also for the elder generation as well you see it high up it's great visibility mm. built on the same safety underpinning as a volvo and a polestar so it's, yeah. it's really from for us it was important to start this not just with any car, but a car that was actually yeah. good in itself, yeah. uh, and then to develop services on that platform mm. and on that uh, product. Yeah. Why? Why only two colors? Purely from a counter positioning <laughs> perspective, we wanted to make it as easy to to become a member of Lincoln Co. as it was to order an iPhone. And, oh. <laughs> but of course, as iPhone has expanded yeah, into now, more colors, now. <laughs> maybe we in the future can have one more color mm-hmm. or two. Yes. So, uh, so like, what changes you want to make? Like, what is the mission? I would say that the mission for us is is clearly to be a part of the urban environment. Mm. So we are an urban brand more than a let's say we're not trying to target all of the market. We yeah. try and and center on yeah. these cities. And for us, the core fundament of our vision is that we don't believe that just because we all replace our cars with electric mm. cars that we have solved every problem that we have. So for us, it's about finding the way to utilize cars in a better way. Mm. So it's this age old statistic, cars stand still for 96% of the time. We thought if we can have a slight nudge on that, Mm. if we can improve that um, utilization slightly, that means that we will have less cars in the cities. Mm. Uh, But of course we want more of the cars in the cities to be our cars, that's natural as a business. Mm. Mm. But that's really where we're coming from to improve that that utilization so that we can dare to reimagine how we create cities. Yeah, yeah. So our mission is not to put more cars in the world. We want more of the cars in the world to be ours, mm-hmm. but to make sure that we're using them better yeah. and and that we I don't think we can fully eliminate the car yet. I don't think that's where we are. No. Um or if we will ever come there, but for us it's really been actively trying to build that mm. thing and, and we've, we've done a lot of studies together with some some partners on this and yeah. we did all the the european capitals and we asked every market the same questions how would you reimagine your city without cars ah. and, and i mean when you ask someone to improve their city yeah very few people say i want more parking space exactly it's, it's not pretty it's <laughs> no. not what you want to do in a city mm. um so we think that's a really strong concept of if we can just do our electrification journey, mm-hmm. because we think that is the right thing, yeah. uh, but also make sure that we have less cars on the streets, but we use them better yeah. and we share them together with each other. Exactly. Uh, we think that's very powerful. Mm. And and 
for us, it's difficult, like when we make cities a plan and design to change behaviors, make it like more sustainable, more mm -hmm. positive. Yeah. How was it in your case? Because like owning cars is something like strong mm -hmm. and you're trying like to change this. So tell me about the beginning. Like uh, when you got like your first, second, how how was it? No, but but in, in, as an entrepreneurial organization, you never know. So you have an idea, but you haven't tested it. Mm. Um, I think a big part of why we succeeded in in bringing such a strong sharing base into the mm. product was because the first step we did was to remove that ownership element. Okay. So we said, it's no longer your car. <laughs> You're borrowing it from us. Mm. Of course, if as you're borrowing it from us, you can share it with whoever because it's not your car. Okay. So that <laughs> shift in that ownership, mm -hmm. you, you, you need to take it in steps. So the yeah. first step was unlock that change from ownership to usership. Mm -hmm. And then take the next step and a leapfrog to, of course, you can share a car that's not yours. It's fully covered by us. Mm -hmm. Insurance is fully covered by us when you share it. Um, and I think that was a big part of why it succeeded. Uh -huh. uh, but of course, we also need to continue to grow the, the platform. And for us, it's very important to take that responsibility even now when more and more of our cars become used cars, because mm -hmm. of course, after a while they come out of the fleet and we sell them as used cars. Yeah. How do we re keep recatching those um, mm. consumers? Yeah. Um, in do, do, who are the users now? Like uh, young, old, middle age? I would say it's quite quite a healthy mix. It's mm -hmm. of course younger than the average. So the the average car buyer in Europe is around fifty five years old. What? Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. But it, it's a lot of capital that you okay. require. Yeah. Uh, but we, I would say our age range is biggest between thirty five and forty five. Uh, so slightly younger, yeah, but not yeah. super young. I think when we started the brand, we went a little bit overboard trying to target very young people. Like. Well, you know, 25 and below year olds. Oh, okay, like students. Uh, yes. And also, uh. But what we can see is we can, of course, now attract the full age range mm -hmm. by providing, of course, subscription for, for the people who can afford that yeah. and, and sharing and borrowing a car mm -hmm. for someone who's maybe a student that only needs the car yeah. to go to Ica and buy some groceries. Mm -hmm. how, how much does it cost? Varies by country. Uh, okay. But if mm. I take an average, I would say it's around 600 euros a month mm -hmm. uh, across the European markets. Some more expensive, some some, yeah. some yeah. less expensive. Uh, and of course, what you get then is you get access to the car. Mm -hmm. uh, you can have it for a month or three months or you can stay with us forever. Uh -huh, so I can like decide how there is no like limit for number of months. That... No, no, okay. no limitation. Uh -huh. Well, the only limitation is that you have to have it for at least 21 days then. <laughs> that would be the, 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 the lower limitation. Yeah. But no, and, and we actually see this trend, which we, of course, were hoping for as well, is that people stick around. Okay. Um, so I think our average contract length today is around 10 months. That's very good. Yeah, and we're very happy with it. And it keeps mm. growing. Yeah. So that means that we're doing something, exactly. something right. Yeah. And, and basically what happens to you if you're a customer who stays for, let's say, two years, mm. After a while, we will just knock on your shoulder and we will say, we'll take the car you have today back mm -hmm. and here's a brand new one. Ah. Because then we want to take that car and, yeah. and realize it as a used car. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's a, it's a very, it's not a concept that's as easy to explain as if you're Tesla, you can just say, we were the first electric car. <laughs> that's a very simple story. For us, it takes a, a, a bit of a longer while to explain mm -hmm. it, but it's basically, we're trying to offer you mobility on your terms yeah yeah so from the the sort of lowest commitment which mm. would be you're, you're borrowing a car from one of our members to upgrading you to being a subscriber where you mm. pay us a monthly fee yeah and if you're someone who drives longer distances or you have more predictability you can go for one of our leasing offers mm. where of course with increased commitment comes a, a slight reduction in price mm. uh, but also what we're working a lot on now is to of course widen the net uh, and also expand on the sort of traditional yeah. buy option. So how do uh -huh. we address that market? Yeah. Because we want as many cars as possible to be on your, the platform. Yeah. You started in Sweden? Yes. And how, uh, like, and then, like, um, is there a difference in which countries, like, uh, growing bigger than the others? Yeah. What do you see on the map? Yeah, I would say we, we opened our, so our headquarters is, is here in, in Sweden. Mm. And we started our first, we opened our first club which is our community centers. Okay. Um, we opened that in Amsterdam. Mm. Uh, that's a little more than two years ago now. Okay. Um, and the Netherlands is still today the, the strongest market. 
uh, by I think all of us are very surprised on, on how how much they like the the Lincoln Co brand. Mm. But it's a bit different. So I would say Netherlands is very strong, Italy very strong, okay. Germany now of course going through a tough time with the with the economic climate but have been rising constantly yeah, so yeah. those those are sort of the biggest markets mm. uh so it, it's a really interesting journey and, and we are today live in seven markets in, in wow Europe. how many years like in total i think it's i think we delivered our first car in april 2021 in europe ah it's not a long time ago no no not, <laughs> not at like all just it's, started in this yeah. industry yeah and it, it's mm. been an amazing uh, learning experience yeah. it's we've sort of you hit a lot of potholes on the way and you learn and you calibrate yeah. um i think now we have this uh, next phase of the company where we go into even more growth next year opening yeah. new markets mm. uh, launching a new car full first fully electric car mm. uh, so a lot of exciting things happening uh, and of course as as any other business today we're trying to efficiently navigate what's going around also, around us yeah uh, but we think we have a very strong concept and mm. something we can really build on for the future. Yeah, you mentioned uh, what do you call it, uh, community house or what do you call it, clubhouse? A club, club, ah, club. not a clubhouse. Thing. Not not a clubhouse. <laughs> uh, that was one of the working names back okay. in the days. But <laughs> we call them clubs. Clubs. Yeah. What, what is inside the clubs? So I would say that the club is a physical manifestation of what we want to create as a brand. Mm. So it's it's more of a community space than it is a retail space. Okay, and it's very deliberate. So there is still a car there, of course, yeah. and you can still come in and you can do your test drives mm. and you can can ask us questions. But yeah. it's really ab- about creating something that's beyond the physical product. So when when we stepped into Europe, we could have just launched this car and said, "Look, here's a car. Yeah, go. It's a slightly cheaper Volvo XC40. Let's go." Mm. Um, but we wanted to do something else. So we wanted to create that bond because we needed that community mm. for the sharing functionality to work. So yeah. we needed people to meet. Uh, so we actually use them a lot for, you know, uh, private associations who come and have their events there, oh, or good. we work together with some cultural things, mm. or we have a yoga class or things like that, yeah. where we try and make them a, a sort of a meeting, living room. Yeah, yeah. a meeting place yeah. for, for people. Yeah. For like-minded mm. people and um, people who really appreciate sort of having a good time you can also come there uh, to co-work with us so mm. you can sit there and, and do your your business during the day there is workstations available and okay cool we really try and bring that sort of second living room into yeah. your life yeah. yeah good way of marketing as well yeah but uh, that's that's really that's how we point, see it yeah. it's a it's the primary purpose of them yeah if you zoom out how is the reaction of different um car manufacturers on what you do well i think they're angry huh <laughs> <laughs> I think inherently it's it's a bit depending on where we we also come from a very traditional group of companies or okay. two of our owners are are car makers and of mm. course their primary KPI is to grow volume at the fastest possible rate yeah. for us with with certain of our business areas of course in the traditional sense with leasing and and buy we of course can grow volume like we want to but with the subscription uh, part it's you have to actually be a little bit more controlled and think in a different way. So instead okay. of thinking as many cars as possible, Produce, yeah. you need to make sure you're matching your demand with your mm. with your supply and, and yeah. really keeping a good track of it. Yeah. Um, but I think we're still surprised that more car makers hasn't joined in on on the type of business models okay. we have. Mm. But of course, it's a bit of a conflicting KPI to try and say we should use <laughs> cars more and have less of them when your key kpi is to try and produce as many as possible yeah volume yeah yeah so so it becomes a conflicting kpi and i think look a lot of them are waking up uh, mm-hmm. there's there's every basically every oem has tried uh, these services either sharing or subscription in uh, some kind of way okay um and i think we will see now in 2024 some of the really big players will will also step into the market mm-hmm. but it means like they will produce less cars, right? Yeah. In well, case they have the subscription model. Yeah, not the subscription inherently, I think. I think subscription is is could be a, a good way to, yeah. to sort of continue your volume projections. I think if you go into sharing more like we do as a as an OEM with your own platform, that sort of conflicts with your KPI. Mm-hmm. Uh, subscription, I think, is a good way for for a lot of new entrants to try and test out their yeah. concepts, yeah. Uh, which is basically what we did. Yeah. Uh, so we just see it as good, healthy competition. Mm-hmm. They grow the market. We can continue to protect our 
our market share yeah. and, and yeah. We, we really welcome it. Did it happen that there were many, many cars compared to how many people that should not own? What do you call it? Subscribe. Subscribe, yeah. I think for us, um, we have a constant healthy uh, order uh, bank of mm. subscription customers. Okay. And more than we can fulfill at the moment. Okay, good. That's um, good. Yeah, it, it's it's good. Mm. It's also, you know, challenging to manage uh, yeah. customer expectations as well. But that that's part we're very happy with. And I think for us, we're just trying to grow the amount of vehicles in the market as fast as we can. Mm. Because then we can hook that back to that sharing platform. Yeah. And if there's a lot of cars available, you will get a healthy supply mm. of, of shareable cars in the market. Yeah. So all ca- all your cars are running now in the city? Yes. No one, no one of them is like in the storage or somewhere waiting for a person to take it. Uh, I would say, well, it's different by different markets, but yeah. there's always, let's say, I think our utilization is somewhere in the 90s. So let's say there's always 10% of the fleet that's either coming back from a customer, waiting to go yeah. out from yeah. a customer. But we we are fortunate enough to to work together with our, our owner's mm. infrastructure here in Europe. Mm. Uh, so we have a lot of... Uh, ability to quickly in and out manage that fleet yeah well you mentioned like the insurance the everything else is on you yeah uh, for the person like uh, subscribing just like driving and use it yeah uh, but then you need like to really have a kind of infrastructure supporting taking care of the car and so on yeah how how do you establish how did you establish this so so of course one of our our owners is uh, volvo yeah and we have a long standing collaboration with their workshop network okay um and we have had some initial scalability issues with that mm. and i think we've all seen that uh, in in certain reviews and i think we we did a big change on this recently where we essentially just handed back a lot of these flows to the workshops themselves uh-huh. so um basically today there's no difference from driving a a Lincoln Co with a Volvo in terms of service experience it's mm. the same network it's the same flows yeah uh, that we have today mm-hmm. what what challenges do you face i would say the biggest challenge is scalability it is running a fleet today mm-hmm. let's say we have 60,000 cars in total on the road in in Europe we own about half of them how many you say Uh, so 60,000 I 60, think in total yeah. is in the market and around 30 30,000 35,000 we own mm. as a company yeah. and operating a, a large fleet like that in an environment which isn't really adapted to that from a from a s- sort of statutory perspective mm. uh, so I, I always take the fun example here in Sweden where you can drive through a road toll Okay. So you drive here in we're in Stockholm here today mm-hmm. and you drive through a um a road toll it will read your registration plate. Yeah. It will then send an invoice to whoever owns the car. Exactly. Yeah. The problem is we own the car <laughs> and we own a lot of cars. So <laughs> so finding scalability in processes like mm-hmm. that has re- is a fun challenge but it is really where we put a lot of focus in the last 12 months is how can we upgrade our processes our systems infrastructure uh-huh. and our physical infrastructure. Mm-hmm to be able to scale to a fleet of 100,000 cars. Exactly. Mm. And when you say we, like how big is the team? Who is in the team? Like the disciplines and so on? Yeah, I would say so. We are, are part of what we call Lincoln Co. International here in Europe. We are around a thousand people in wow. Europe. Yeah, so it's been quite the growth. Yeah. Uh, and I would say around 300 of them are customer facing. So they either work in our clubs Mm-hmm. or in our customer service organization okay. with the answering phone calls from from customers. Uh, the rest is sort of corporate function. Yeah. Uh, but it is really, we take the full scope. So we, we're responsible for sales. Mm-hmm. We're also responsible for running connectivity, um, service engineering, yeah. all of these things like aftermarket related stuff in, mm-hmm. in Europe. All of that we run here in, in Europe as an organization. Okay. You say in Europe, like is there... A- You have other markets like in other continents? Yeah. Uh, okay. So our, our biggest market is, of course, China. So mm. that's our, our where our home mother, where our biggest owner is located. Okay. So it's, uh-huh. that's where we first deploy the car. Mm. It's, of course, the biggest market by far. Uh, we also have a small, small market presence in the Middle East. Mm. And, and then we have Europe. Okay. Uh, Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Where, uh, how to say, where is next? Where do you want like the, the next market or the next goal? Where? Uh, the next goal is actually now quite early into 2024 to open up um, Southeast Europe, so mm. Balkans, uh, Croatia, Greece, yeah. those markets, and then follow that with with you know 
the rest of the eastern part of Europe and yeah. you know, all the way up to the Baltics. That's the ambition. And mm -hmm. then, of course, we will see oh, how, how yeah. far we come. Uh, and after that, we basically want to close out the rest of the European markets to become pan-European by somewhere around 26, I would say we are going to be, be fully yeah. established. Yeah. And then, of course, the biggest market we haven't gone into, which is because we have the steering wheel on what they call the wrong side, <laughs> uh, is, of course, the UK. So yeah. that's, a, that's okay. a big thing. And we're targeting that, hopefully, with the next car model. Yeah. When you want, let's say, to, to start a market or establish, how do you start? Let's say uh, I'm a country or a city yeah. and like you want to establish your cars. How, yeah. how does it work, the process? Well, we've, we've been very fortunate being located here in Sweden. There's a lot of organizations, semi-state-owned organizations okay. that can help you when you're starting an export business in Swedish terms. Mm. Uh, so we do always start with this pre-study, looking into the market, what is the market potential, but also what are the specific rules around the business model that we are running. Mm. Um, so there's a lot of things you need to set up yeah. to be able to sell a car in Europe. To do the homework, huh? Yeah, and the first thing you learn is, of course, that Europe is not one nation. Ah, <laughs> Every okay. market is different. Yeah. Um, but we do that. It takes around 12 months from start to finish to set up a market. Okay. Um, and of course, we can scale quite quickly because of the the connection to our owners and their infrastructure. Mm. So, but how, how how do you enter? Like you just okay. Let's say you did the the pre study and mm. you see this city is like mm. very good for mm. for you. Mm. You just send your cars or how? <laughs> Usually, we we try and we we of course because most of our sales happen online. So we can open mm. a market just by flipping on a website. Yeah. And in the, in the beginning, we do offer, of course, we activate the market with some test drives and we try and, and make a presence. Okay. But usually we really see a market kick off when we place a club in there. So when we ah, go and do that big physical, opening, yeah. yeah. Mm. So we'll say, like, sort of Stockholm, now we're here. Mm -hmm. That's where you really see the order uh, intake go up. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so it is interesting how you, you still need that physical footprint because it's some, some level of security yeah. that you are actually there. You can talk to someone in that country. Exactly. Uh, you can of course always call us. We answer you in whatever local language you would like. Okay, but it, cool. it's I think it's a psychological thing. Mm, I think so. That you want something present. Yeah. And what what is your uh, how to say responsibility nowadays? What do you work with? What do you focus on? Me as a person or yeah, the company? Not you. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm the chief financial officer. Yeah. So I I have a bit of a broader scope. I call it CFO plus. Uh, so I have the finance function, I have purchasing technology so okay. all our, our infrastructure uh, plus our customer service organization so i have quite the lot quite the broad uh, scope and yeah. it's, it's a lot of fun how, and what is your background like tell us take us back in time how, <laughs> how you end up here well i, I actually i so i'm from sandviken which is in uh, slightly north i don't dare to say it's in the north of sweden because people <laughs> yeah, because... will be angry uh, but i'm in semi nor north of sweden yeah. um s sort of had a technical route in my high school days mm. but realized quite quickly that I'm not going to become an engineer. Okay. My brain is not programmed like that. Uh, so then I did a lot of work within telco, um, then started studying, uh, ended up in, in the big four consulting world. Okay. Uh, and Lincoln Co. was actually my last client. So ah. my last project for, for that company was to set up the first legal entity for Lincoln Co. in, in, in Europe. And then my boss at the time said, Basically, do you want to continue to make PowerPoints for the rest of your life or do you want to come and change the car industry? Wow. So it was a pretty easy decision. Uh, I've never regretted it. Uh, and I've been here now for six and a half years. Oh, that's a lot. Cool. Yeah, yeah. So you're enjoying it. I'm enjoying every day. Yeah, yeah. It's always tough. Uh, mm -hmm. I think people who, who are at early stages of companies yeah. think it's very exciting and it's new and everything, but it's also a lot of work. A lot of work, um, yeah. But I, I do enjoy it. We have great people. Uh, we're very proud of the teams we have built up. Yeah, and and as long as you're smiling every time you come into the office, then you know you're doing the right thing. That's that's good to hear. Yeah, yeah. and also like I can feel you know when I interview my my guest, I can feel the energy when they yeah. talk. If they like what they talk yeah. about, or no, not really. Yeah. So no, I can feel there's a good good <laughs> vibes and good energy. So good. good. Uh, and you you collect a lot of data as a company, yes. right? Yes. What do you do with the data? Well, I I think. <laughs> So different things, of course, you of course try and understand what's what's happening. But I think we have this core 
functionality where we, we also own a lot of cars where we can also yeah. make sure that all the cars are feeling well at all times. Yeah. So there's, of course, a lot of innovation in telematics and, and, and things like that where we can extract and track what's going on mm -hmm. with our fleet. Okay. Um, so that has had a lot of impact in how we steer uh, our, our traditional after-sales business or service business. But of course, we also have the ability, because we're direct to consumer, mm -hmm. we know exactly who our customers are. We know where they sort of are located. Yeah. So we can really address and be smart about how we leverage that data. Mm -hmm. But also something where we want to become better mm -hmm. is that how do you, of course, leverage that data together with cities? How do you make sure that all the data that we know as a, as a seller of, of mobility, yeah. what can we provide in that mm. sort of broader dialogue of how should you be designing the cities? Because yeah. you can really see where are people using a lot of cars? Where is sharing really popular? So if you go into a city where you can see that sharing is really um, sort of working out, mm. you have some cities in, in the Netherlands, for instance, where shareable cars park for free. Ah. Things oh, like that good. is where you can use data, you can leverage it, you can yeah. have a, a dialogue with, with whoever municipality or city and try and, and really interact as a company. Yeah. Well, and tell us more, like where in the city people park most or, or drive most or share most? But uh, I would say that, that it goes into two categories. So, mm -hmm. so you have a lot of people who, who live in the city yeah. who maybe don't use their car during the weeks. So maybe they only have their car because they need to do something in the weekend. Yeah. There we can see that in the inner cities, we have a lot of people sharing their cars, making them available on the platform during the weekdays. Good. But of course, you have a conflicting demand then because you have a lot of people who want to use the cars during the weekends. Yeah. You will always have that demand peak. So you can mm -hmm. see how prices can surge in the, in the weekends when someone is trying to book them. Uh -huh. um, but then it's still the age-old thing where I think we can always improve is that, of course, a lot of people who live just outside of the city usually drive their car into work. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and what we're saying then, then let's leverage that opportunity for those eight hours when mm. that car is standing over here somewhere on a parking lot, mm. make it available then for someone who needs it during the day. Yeah. You, uh, it, does the price change when you share or? Yeah. So, so the, the, the pricing is dynamic. Mm. It's set completely by the user. Ah. So, so we don't touch it. The only thing we take is a service fee for maintaining the platform. Mm -hmm. um, but basically it's a peer to peer. It's just like Airbnb. Okay. So we never touch the transaction. Uh -huh. It's purely between you and whoever is yeah, borrowing yeah. your car. Yeah. And I can set as much as I want or, yes. or yes. Like, do you give me a guideline like average? We, we, do, we do give you like a recommended price, yeah. which is continuously updated based yeah. on what's going on in the market. Yeah. But I think you can see some really fun dynamics because people are clever. So you can see <laughs> so we, we have some, some really good sharers yeah. in, in the <laughs> Netherlands. We have around 50 people in Europe who actually on a monthly basis earn more from sharing their vehicle than they pay us for the vehicle. What? Yes, but you can see what these people are doing. What they're doing. Yeah, but they're creating, just as you remember how it was when the when Uber came in the beginning, mm, yeah. they, they all wanted really good ratings, right? Mm. So they put some water bottles in, some snacks and stuff. <laughs> we see the same behavior oh, with God. our shares. Yeah. yeah, that's fun. Yeah. And uh, like, what is the average of... of I would say it's very very different per, yeah, per market. Yeah. I would say, in general, I would say the highest prices, which are are sort of in the, I don't know the exact number, but 20, 30 euros an hour, maybe on a weekend in, in the Netherlands, mm. whilst in Sweden, it's maybe 100 sek per okay. hour. So like you can 10 see euros. It, Yeah, and it, it's, it's really this supply and demand. And, and yeah, I think when someone starts to share their car, you can see that they're sort of, they want to try it. So then they put some lower prices in uh -huh. to see, okay, yeah, someone yeah. picking it up. And then they find that natural path. Yeah, exactly. Where, where can I be? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And all of this, like, it's accessible on a uh, phone application, I guess. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So on the on the Lincoln Co app. So yeah. in the Lincoln Co app, if you have a car, if you have a, or if you're a subscriber or someone who has bought the yeah. car, you will see the car menu, which is the normal. You know, you can put on your climate control. You uh, can lock and unlock the yeah, doors. Yeah. But if you're just a borrower, meaning you have no contract with us mm. other than car sharing, the first thing you see is the map. Okay, and where you, are the cars? Exactly, and you look at that map. And you hit one of them and you request a booking. And then, of course, it's up to the one who's sharing it with yeah, you to accept yeah. it. And then, so, so it's really fun to see how the, the platform is working. And it's, we've had it in beta now for 
um, around two years. We haven't taken any service charges. Uh-huh. We haven't done any sort of paid marketing to try and grow yeah. uh, the platform. So it's grown organically to yeah. where it is today. Uh, but now since uh, a couple of weeks back, we released it into full functionality mode. Cool. And and we're now starting to push it, so we yeah. will see some some uptick for sure. Yeah, you you have one more person to try it. I will try it this yeah. weekend. Yeah, but do it. You Sounds do it. Sounds really yeah. interesting. And please let me know. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> how it work. <laughs> if I share, if I publish this episode, it means like it's a good exactly. <laughs> then I know <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was fine. <laughs> but tell me, does this? If we have to say, if we scale this up, yep. and look at the city uh, mm. perspective, does mm. it mean that we're gonna have less parking spaces, or or what? But I think you have to have a dialogue in terms of if if we, if we all can use cars in a better way, mm. then we need less cars. Then, of course, we can have less parking spaces available. Mm. If we do that, that extrapolates into how you can rethink and design an area of a city. Yeah. Uh, so I think you need to have that dialogue. And I think for us, um, we always try and engage in those dialogues together with public transport companies mm. or micro mobility companies. And it's sort of what we think is very important is how do we work together mm. to create an integrated system? Yeah, Because it's my personal opinion is that the second you start trying to tell people that they cannot move around as they would like yeah. to, y- you will start to lose them. True. Uh, so you need to offer a variety of ways, but I think where we can be better, mm. uh, both as, as car makers, but also uh, public transport is to try and work together. Yeah. And I'm I'm always so amazed. I have this dream vision. Yeah, tell me. So I was I was in Oslo uh, earlier in the year, and I was on a bus. Yeah, with a friend of mine, and he said, "Look up at the where you can see where the next station is." Yeah, the screen. Exactly. So there you can see how many scooters are available at the next stop for you to just do that last mile really? transportation. Yeah, for me it felt what? like yeah, and I thought. <laughs> <laughs> what this are we doing like in Sweden? Future, no? The Norwegians are beating us. <laughs> and and then you have a dialogue with some of the public transport uh, companies in Sweden and all of them want to collaborate. Mm. You think, but if we can now just find a way yeah. to open up or at least partner together in these programs to yeah. try and find these ways of offering different mm. modes of, of mobility within a city, yeah. we're more than happy to be the app for it. Yeah, But of course, if someone else wants to be the app, that's okay as well. We just want to initiate that dialogue because mm. we think if we can unlock that potential, yeah. then we can really rethink how do we actually design cities. Exactly. And how do we make them as a place where people can live, not where people drive. Yeah. And and how is the reaction of a, of a city, like city authority? I think in, in general, every city we have ever talked to is, is very open for dialogue. Okay. Uh, but I think... I can mostly relate to Sweden. Okay, yeah, I live Stockholm here and I, Sweden, yeah. I do most of the work here. But I would say what I think is missing is that sort of joint effort. Mm-hmm. I always use the example of the West Swedish package, an old infrastructure package. Right? Okay. It has a good name. Everybody understands <laughs> what's happening and everybody can align around it. Mm. So I think mo- many of the, the European markets should try and focus on that because We've all sort of accepted that we're going to do this EU green deal. We're all going to move in this direction. But how do we now then, instead of saying, here are all the regulatory frameworks you as a company need to adhere to, Mm. how can we instead focus on actually realizing something? Uh, Because I think we've had a couple of years now, I think it was even Macron who said it, that okay, we've had so many new regulations come in now. We need some years now to actually implement exactly yeah um, and i think we are at that cross section mm-hmm. i think that's also a way out of this economic environment we are in now try and take these big yeah. uh, unified infrastructure projects and and we're more than happy to be a part of that dialogue and i think many other mobility players we'll want that to. too yeah yeah but what is what is like the the barrier like if you're happy to collaborate and mm. this organization happy to collaborate what makes it like so difficult to to come together and do something well, I, I think it's a combination of, of different factors. Mm. I think for us as a business, it's always that we are constantly trying to just run our own business. Okay, yeah, so we, focus we, on what you have. Exactly. Oh. So, so you become very centered as an entrepreneurial yeah. organization. But I think also for the cities and, and the municipalities, one of the big problems is, of course, there are many of them. Mm. They're not the same. So within yeah. one country, you will have different municipalities, different cities yeah. with different ways of steering. Mm. Um, so it's really hard to, as a small organization, try and be everywhere. True. Um, so I think that's the biggest challenge is mm. how do we find 
opportunities to easily connect across an entire market. Yeah, like take doing, it all in. Yeah. Instead of doing every discussion with every city or municipality. Yeah, it takes time and energy, right? Yeah. Yeah. And and the, the data, do you uh, do you share them or no? Just have a dialogue about them? More that we have a dialogue about them. Yeah, I yeah. think we've tried in we've tried to explore on a number of occasions, okay, how would we look at that? Mm -hmm. And of course, you're very mindful today, you don't want to share customer information. You want to be very protective of, of GDPR related items, yeah. etc. So there is a limit to what you can share effectively. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think for us, we are prepared to step into that and explore mm. it but i think we need someone's help to also be a little bit clear on what is okay to share uh, yeah, uh, yeah. and and how do we then deposit that into mm. some it's easier than if you have a program if you're running a, a joint true. program yeah. you can say we will contribute with this data you contribute you, with this yeah, data yeah. Yeah, yeah because i think that's where where the city planners need as well they need mm. to understand how are people moving around in the cities, what are the different means yeah. of transportation, what is popular, what is not popular, and how could we change it? Exactly, because how to say, the the the, the main point of, of having your perspective here is like, when we plan cities, we need to have an input. Mm. Uh, now a lot of cities going for like banning cars from the city centers, mm. uh, a lot of cities um, removing parking spaces, mm. you know, there are different like action mm. taking now. Mm. Uh, but I think with, with this kind of data, maybe things will be a bit better for the planners, like a bit, the image will be a bit clearer mm. for, for, for us. Yeah. What do you think about uh, car-free city centers or district areas? Well, well I, I'm, I'm not against it at all. Mm. I, I think it's an interesting concept. But once again, I think as soon as you're trying to limit the, the, the human race is a very curious one, right? Mm. They mm. want to move around mm. and they want to be free. and when you try and restrict that, you will always get pushback. Mm -hmm. But I think inherently, of course, having a city without cars is not a bad concept. Mm -hmm. It's more, what do you offer as an alternative? Okay. And I come back to that. Think of that, that you're driving in them from the suburbs. You're about to hit this restricted area. Mm -hmm. But why don't we have a, a connection then between the car that can easily identify an electric scooter or a normal bike mm -hmm. that you can just book it directly in the car software. You park your car at whatever little yeah. parking spaces are left, mm. and you can then do your last mile into the city. Yeah. I think that's how we need to think. It's a, it's a system, it's, a, it's an ecosystem that we need to help each other find a format to where we can work together, a yeah. standard for how should this work? Because mm. if, you, if you're working from standards, it's very easy because they're very predictable, they are long-term, you know what you're investing in. And I think that's where governments and, and companies like you sort of that work a lot with this, with city planning, et cetera, that, that they can try and create that foundation for us as, mm. as mobility players to try and interact with. Yeah. Otherwise we end up with scooters flying everywhere yeah, right. and yeah. there's no rules. Yeah. Uh, as a business, we appreciate when the rules are clear, mm -hmm. when they are predictable, yeah. and when we have a long horizon, so we know where should we spend yeah, exactly. our money. Exactly. Do you, uh, how to say, the, the next step of uh, car industry, Yeah. What what do you see, or where is this industry heading mm. to? Well, I, I think we've sort of had the ba battle. I always well, I'm of that generation. I always say it's the HD DVD versus Blu-ray <laughs> discussion, <laughs> and sort of electrification is the Blu-ray version, so they won the battle. Yeah, so we've yeah. now decided that electrification is is here to stay. Yeah. So of course we will all electrify our products yep. we will all work on smarter ways of manufacturing them so we lower our footprint and then yeah. going in with a, with a product that's solid because if you can remove that sustainability element mm -hmm. all of a sudden you can talk about transportation again okay and um, so you when transportation is a problem for the climate it's always going to be a problem for yeah. the climate so you need to neutralize those aspects mm -hmm. then of course over time i think all oems and ourselves included need to think that it's probably not a new OEM that's going to take us out of business. It's mm. probably someone who's going to invent a service that replaces that mobility need. Yeah. Um, I don't think that self-driving cars are any time in the near future. No. But I do think there will come other mobility concepts okay. um, that will replace the car to a larger extent, especially in the larger cities. Because, As a vehicle? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah but I, I really think that. And I think you will always have someone who will come out of the blue 
Yeah. They will invent a service. They will become some level of aggregator. Yeah. And all of a sudden, you're just a supplier to that industry. Okay. <laughs> and we've said from, from Lincoln Code that if it ever comes down to becoming uh, sort of SAS or Airbus, <laughs> we want to be SAS, not Airbus. Mm. But of course, all OEMs today are more Airbus. They make cars. Yeah. Um, so I think we all need to be very mindful of that mm-hmm. uh, as a unit, but also then dare to think about a horizon where maybe you're a service company instead. Maybe it doesn't matter who manufactures the car because mm-hmm. no one will think about a car. They will think about the mean of transportation. Yeah, like how, how, how they transport and so yeah. on. So we have a lot of listeners working with city planning, city mm-hmm. de- urban design. What is what are the aspects that we should think about, like from your perspective? Well, I think that there always has to be a, a dialogue around infrastructure. Mm-hmm. So now as as we are electrifying the vehicle fleet, yeah. you need to think about infrastructure. You need to think about how do we integrate that in a smart way in a city. Yeah. Um, but also I think city planners should always think that humans are flexible. There's m- many ways they can move around in a city. So there is okay. it's okay if it's a perimeter. Okay. But I think city planners should fill the cities with culture, with mm-hmm. things for families, and, and ways to explore and enjoy life. Mm-hmm. Uh, restaurants are way more important than cars. Mm-hmm. Uh, but cars will always be a means of transportation, so you need to integrate them well. Mm-hmm. But if you then create certain areas where Let's say if you have a shareable, shareable car, it's fine if you park it there because then it's like a station. Yeah. Um, so that's okay. And then if you make sure that we have enough infrastructure so we can, can charge all these cars and we can have them, mm. as long as we can do things that make sure that there's less cars in the cities, yeah, it will all work out. But you have to have that harmony. You can't just take the cars out of the equation and because then you will lose the public. Mm. Um, to try and find those ways of, of integrating them. Yeah. Is there a skill that we should learn or develop as a city makers? Oh, I'm not an expert on that. Uh, I would say, I think finding better interactions. So, so instead of, I don't think necessarily there's a skill that's missing from anyone who plans a city. But I think as, as city planners, you spend a lot of time talking to the people who live in cities or people mm-hmm. who live in cities, but also maybe come and talk to us. And, and how can we find those interactions uh-huh. and learnings from each other? Mm-hmm. I think that's something where we could really benefit from. Yeah. Because then we can also build better products. Yeah. Because that, in the end, like how to say, when you share data or, or, or yeah. knowledge, then you design something that fits everyone. Yeah. Is yeah like it's, not, it's not a one-way street. It shouldn't be. Yeah. Should, we, we should learn something as well. If you have an ambition mm-hmm. with, where you want to go long-term, because I assume your horizon is even longer than our horizons are, Uh, so where are you heading yeah. and coming back to that predictability mm. as long as it's very predictable we can always adapt as a mm. business mm. and i think we want to understand what you're envisioning because we want to make sure that we can be a part of the cities of the future yeah we yeah. don't want to be completely excluded and then just have to adapt to mm. It. Mm. Um, so i think that's that's an area where we're more than happy to welcome you and your colleagues down yeah, to gothenburg of course, of we'll course. take you through what we're doing and, and really show our ideas yeah So I'm very happy that you came here and yeah. shared your, your, your story with us. And I will try it as well. Yeah. I'm very, how to say, um, looking forward to this experience because yeah. I don't own a car and also live in the city. Yeah. It's actually like one of like these uh, people that are already subscribing maybe. So uh, the last question here is mm. that you give three takeaway messages to our listeners. Mm. So I would say then there to... When you venture into business or your job in general, dare to reimagine the concept that you're working mm-hmm. for. Try and design with a mind of interconnecting with customers and other businesses around there. And then just have fun with okay. whatever you're doing. Try and find the, the joy in it. Try and find that element because it will motivate you, your teams mm-hmm. to make even better products. And in the end, your customers will love them. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming and keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you for having me.